The one thing the bishop cannot delegate is the ethos and culture of the diocese. My concern in the Diocese of Salisbury is to renew hope through the core activities of prayer and service so that people grow as individuals commun and communities in the way of Jesus Christ. So as each week, I think we'll begin by praying the prayer for the diocese renewing hope. God, our Father, renew our hope. By the Holy Spirit's power, strengthen us to pray readily, serve joyfully, and grow abundantly, rejoicing in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On your seats, you should have, or there wasn't quite enough for everybody, there was a couple of postcards. One from Art and Christianity Inquiry, I'll talk a little bit, a bit about them. And the other's a postcard of the East Window, simply because I've got hundreds of them. Uh, and I am at the East Window from St Martin in the Field. And, and um, I've got hundreds of them because the um, arrangement in the sanctuary's changed. It's no longer uh, as it is. And therefore they gave the old vicar lots. Um, but I'm going to talk about it. Uh, I was told last week not everybody could hear. If you can't hear, put your hand up at some point and I might just tell you to move forward because there are seats at the front. Um, but I'll also type, uh, talk louder. But I also, uh, my wife pointed out to me what only wives and Christine Nielsen Craig can tell you. There was a typo in this last week, which I've corrected. And the last notice is that there's a bookstall around the corner, uh, which Jenny Mons from Sarum College Bookshop has uh, got. And there are some very good books, uh, one of which is called The Art of Worship, which might be of interest. <laughs> Um, in the first of the four Serum Lectures on Renewing Hope, I explored how the gift of pastoral ministry is integral to the life of the church and the building up of the body of Christ. In this central project of Christianity, we become more like Christ, more fully human. Good pastoral care is educational, prophetic, evangelistic, and apostolic in keeping with the pattern that is given in Ephesians 4. Each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift, that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Good pastors grow people, congregations and communities. One of the things that we recognised was that varied people need varied ways to engage with Christianity, and that good though they are, putting on a Christian basics course isn't going to be the means of discipling everyone. In this week's lecture, I want to explore the engagement of the church with art and see that there is a sort of Christian apologetics at work, which is not primarily about the mind and engages us in a different way to talkative Christianity. Simply being in this building is to remember this. And then next week I'll explore one of the big themes of our day, the care of God's earth, our common home. And in the last of the four lectures I'll come back to God renewing hope as we pray, serve and grow as the people of God in this place. And I'll say each week, if you can't come to the whole series, I hope there'll be something of value in each lecture of its own right. So don't feel that you're missing out hugely. You'll get what you get by coming when you do and can. About a third of the paintings in the National Gallery are explicitly of Christian subjects, many of them illustrating biblical stories. One of my favorites is Caravaggio's depiction of the supper at Emmaus, it's an illustration of a well-known Bible story, but it is so much more than an illustration. On that first Easter day, two disciples walked to Emmaus, a village about seven miles from Jerusalem. While they walked, they talked about the events of the last few days. Jesus joined them, but they didn't recognize him. As they journeyed together, he interpreted what had happened through the scriptures, beginning with Moses and the prophets. 
As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. Caravaggio has depicted the moment of revelation. It's a sort of evangelistic moment. You get drawn into the picture. Jesus does not have the traditional beard, so is not recognised until the familiar blessing of the bread. To the disciples, though not to the waiter, it is startling. The dish of ripe fruit is about to tip off the table towards us. The disciple on the right is wearing a scallop shell, the badge of a pilgrim, actually the badge of a pilgrim to Santiago, uh, someone who is on the way. The other one's elbow pushes through a hole in his jacket and it's a hole in the painting's canvas. He's coming into our space. The contrast, the sharp contrast between light and dark uh, is terrifically dramatic. Um, and I think it's that, that contrast and the sort of suddenness of what is this moment of revelation and the gap on this side of the table which draws us into the painting and that gap at the table is for us. That's where we're being invited into as the people looking at the painting. The stories in the Gospel of the Resurrection are transitory moments, significant enough to change lives forever. In his day, on the whole, most of Caravaggio's paintings were well received, and younger artists saw them as miracles a sort of school of art called Caravaggisti was still around a century later. It was the light and dark that was so exciting. But some of his paintings were rejected by the church. Caravaggio was born in Milan in 1571. He arrived in Rome at the height of the Inquisition. He led a double life between the powerful cardinals who were his patrons and the taverns and prostitutes, gamblers and brawlers, where he also found his models. Around 1601 to 1606, the Supper at Emmaus is 1601, so we're in the same period, he painted the death of the Virgin, which is now in the Louvre. It was commissioned by a Vatican official for the Carmelite Church of Santa Maria della Scala, a church, building, a church being built to provide a place of honour for what was thought to be a miraculous icon of the Virgin. When the monks saw Caravaggio's painting, they were alarmed. Caravaggio had used the body of a prostitute fished out of the Tiber as a model. Her legs were exposed and her body was swollen. Caravaggio highlights the bald pates of some of the disciples, their faces mostly hidden by shadows and hands. It was far too realistic and devoid of what people thought of as holiness. It was not conducive to reverence and did not lead people to worship. Only a faint halo, just to the right of the Virgin's head, and the light falling her and presumably Mary Magdalene at the front and some of the central disciples behind her, only the light falling from above um, gave traditional signs of a devotional painting. This picture was breaking new ground and the church wanted something that looked more spiritual and less worldly. 
but Caravaggio was embarked on an iconographic revolution, moving away from the formal way in which sanctity was depicted. The art historian Maurizio Calvesi says Caravaggio is the opposite of the Baroque, which glorifies wealth, luxury, and the triumphant Catholic Church. He was deeply revolutionary. He brought the human aspect of God back to earth. Cardinal Borromeo wrote in indignation, contaminated men must not deal with the sacred. The 19th century art critic John Ruskin called him the ruffian Caravaggio. Simon Sharma calls Caravaggio the naughty boy of art. One of the education department at the National Gallery said Caravaggio was the Damien Hirst of his day. Caravaggio raises questions that are still around in the way the church engages with, the, with art. Does the artist have to be a Christian for their art to be suitable for a church? Or is all that matters for the art to be good art? And if so, who decides? Much the same question was raised a few years ago by Alan Bennett's play, The Habit of Art, at the National Theatre. I don't know if you saw it. It was about Benjamin Britten and W.H. Auden. I hated it. I thought it demeaned two great artists, musician and poet. You are a rent boy. I am a poet. Over the wall lives the Dean of Christchurch. We all have our parts to play. Or was Bennett being uncomfortably truthful and raising the same sorts of questions as Caravaggio did in his day? Great art is not necessarily the product of admirable lives. Indeed, an awareness of the brokenness and incompleteness of humanity, a healthy doctrine of sin, might be the prerequisite of creativity. In a book to be published this month, so I haven't read it, called Art and Church, A Fractious Embrace, Jonathan Kersley Kate, I'm not sure about the pronunciation of that, Jonathan Kersley Kate, says that a vibrant critical exchange between contemporary art and Christianity is being increasingly prompted by an expanding program of art installations and commissions for ecclesiastical spaces. Rather than religious art reflecting Christian ideology, current practices frequently initiate projects that question the values and traditions of the host space, of present objects and events that challenge its visual conventions. I agree with him that contemporary art should be an element of modern churches. And I know that sometimes it can be a fractious embrace, as we've seen. I'm much less sure that this is the way to define the relationship. Indeed, sometimes I wish it were more so because most art in Christian places is polite and well-mannered and sometimes lacking in confidence. I think that's partly because the places are of such significance in themselves, but also because most artists are sensitive and respectful to that significance, regardless of whether they share the beliefs embodied in that space. This cathedral is a very fine example of the church's engagement with art. In having a programme of regular art exhibitions, Salisbury vividly exemplifies what is now the case in most cathedrals and churches. The temporary installations add significance, life and energy, and they create interest for visitors. Sometimes I imagine we all wonder what on earth they are about. As with the present installation, Sophie Ryder's Relationships, I like the way it plays with scale, relationships, and it seems a very cheerful celebration of creativity in spring. But it has invaded the cathedral space in ways which are not exactly on our own terms. There have been a number of complaints. I don't understand the person who told me very firmly it is pagan and unsuited for a cathedral. I also note the number of people around the sculptures where the grass has been worn 
and got muddy. It's rather more Radio 2 than the cathedral is used to. Sometimes the installations here are more overtly religious, challenging and stretching of our self-understanding, as with Nicholas Pope's The Apostles, which was here two years ago in the Trinity Chapel. We don't know much about some of the apostles, but they are foundational to the life of the church. I loved the way these very different shapes lit what for me is regular worship space in that part of the cathedral where the foundation stones were laid. The arts programme alongside last year's celebrations of Magna Carta 800 ranged from the fairly highbrow Tariq O'Regan and Alex, Alice Goodman's A Letter of Rights. Do you remember that? Terrific music, but what a beat and what sort of visceral language, skin. It begins with the killing of sheep. I mean, it was very powerful. Um, so they ranged from that to the tiles made by prisoners in Earl Stoke Prison, where the point was, well, I hesitate to say this, but I think the point was as much the connection with the prisoners marking Magna Carta 800 as with the art itself. The very popular interactive display in the North Porch, Squid Soup's Enlightenment, engaged people using very contemporary technology to explore one of the big issues of Magna Carta in the present day, its connection with human rights in our post-Enlightenment society. A different language exploring similar concepts. It didn't tell you what to think, it made a different sort of engagement with Magna Carta that was beyond words. Wonderfully playful. Good and varied as the temporary installations are, there are three great contemporary art commissions here in the cathedral, which is one of the great buildings of Western Europe. They do much more than illustrate aspects of what the building is about. They help to define the space and shape our understanding of it. So the first two are William Pye's font, which was installed in 2008, and the second is the Prisoners of Conscience window by Gabriel Loir, which was installed in 1981, and Sidney Evans was dean. We enter the Christian life and the church by the font through baptism. The large space between the font and the east window is for prayer, contemplation, for worship, which is the purpose of life. Christianity is for worship. Doing good is a consequence and test of it. When Jesus of Nazareth came, when, when Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day as was his custom. He stood to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah which was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. The east window is dedicated to prisoners of conscience. To proclaim release to the captives. It's very dark blue, which is populated by people who are hard to see, even close to. I think it's a window that's exceptionally hard to read. Certainly at a distance, the colour has more impact than anything that is depicted. Though at the centre, and it took me ages to see this, is Christ on the cross. From bottom left to top right, it's as if a door has been opened, giving light to people in darkness. But there's also light from above, hope in two directions. 
Immediately below the window in the Trinity Chapel, we pray for the work of Amnesty International, as we do for the South Sudan and Sudan, with whom the diocese has been linked for over 40 years. We pray for peace and social justice. In this worship space, between the font and that vision which comes from the prophet Isaiah, which Jesus came to bring about, in that space between the two, we find ourselves in worship, challenged by the God who comes among us to let the oppressed go free. The cathedrals, like a laboratory of the spirit, which fosters a commitment to social justice because we live in this time with a memory of paradise and a hope of heaven. This hope fires us and is a focus for our prayers. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's the purpose of church. This cathedral is dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. So the third of the great contemporary commissions, I think, is the one outside the cathedral, Elizabeth Frink's. Uh, is she the walking Madonna? Mary magnifies the Lord, walking away from her cathedral with its sacred space between the font and the east window in which it's quite possible to have the experience and miss the meaning that the love of God in Jesus Christ is good news for everyone. She is walking towards the city in the way that happens at the end of every service when the priest tells the people to go out and get on with the work of God in the world God made and loves. It's in this interplay of church and world that we challenge encourage, and encourage one another about what it means to love God and to love our neighbour. I think these commissions are of a very different order to the temporary installations, partly because they're high quality, but also because they were very carefully thought out in terms of what was their purpose? How did they shape, define the space? How did they frame the experience of everyone who comes here, visitors and regulars alike? You need confidence to commission new art in a building as significant as this. They're part of the way in which the faith is proclaimed here, a very Christian, a very clear Christian apologetic. Though what you can't be sure of is the effect that they will actually have. You can't determine that. They simply frame the experience in a particular kind of way that enhances the way the building proclaims the Christian story. I talked a bit last week about my having been the Vicar of St Martin in the Fields in central London. Throughout the 20th century, St. Martin's was known for its ethics rather than its aesthetics. Um, this was a church that never spelt, spent money on itself, and my goodness, it showed. Um, these were burial vaults uh, created by John Nash in the 1820s. Um, thought to be state-of-the-art care for the dead at the time. They were condemned as unfit for the dead in 1849 and then used by the living throughout the 20th century as a social care unit for London's homeless people and for a variety of community uses. This is a Chinese People's Day Centre um, and they're dancing underneath. Do you see those rather nice hangings which are plastic sheets to catch the drips coming through? And by the light fittings, there are plastic bottles with funnels collecting the water. The mayor of Westminster wasn't terribly impressed when he came to visit. Um, but there is another tradition associated with St Martin's which had deep roots. And that is that the beautiful is also the best and morally good. 
This is the model made by the, art, uh, by the architect James Gibbs to show the vestry, what the new church of St Martin in the Fields, which was dedicated in 1726, would look like. It's in the V and A in their architectural galleries now, and it is absolutely beautiful. You can take the model apart and see the inside. When the new church of St Martin's was consecrated on the 20th of October 1726, the vicar, Dr Zachariah Pierce, preached on the text from Genesis 28, 18. And Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillow and set it up for a pillow and poured oil upon the top of it. This is the conclusion of the story of Jacob's ladder. This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. James Gibbs's building was the summation of everything that was known about the temple in the 1720s. St Martin's was the best that London could offer to God. They had used the most skillful craftsmen and the best materials that were available to create the finest church of its day. It was much criticised for it. St Martin's cost £36,000 in contrast to its neighbours at St Giles in the Fields who turned in a very handsome church for less than a third of the cost. But there was something here about the importance of capital investment and of doing things to the highest standards. The buildings renewal in the early 21st century was at a time when the economy was strong and London was booming and British art was among the best in the world. So we wanted to use the buildings renewal project to try to combine the two traditions of ethics and aesthetics. Our own inexperience, the scale of the task and the significance of the location was such that we knew our need for help. We assembled panels of friends and advisors, including an arts advisory panel with some senior and highly regarded people who would give good advice to the church and also help to carry the public discussion that would properly take place about any major work planned for what Simon Jenkins called England's most loved, most photographed, most imitated parish church. And Sir Nicholas Goodison, who chaired the Arts Advisory Panel, said, I think with prescience, good art creates controversy. We had some experience of this in relation to the Christmas crib that St Martin's puts in Trafalgar Square each Christmas. For the turn of the millennium, we wanted something different that would get people to think about whose millennium it was. Instead of a conventional Christ Christmas crib, we commissioned Mike Chapman, whom we had met through the Portland Sculpture Trust in Dorset, to produce a baby in stone. The traditional crib scene is a compilation of nativity stories in Luke and Matthew's Gospel. This baby in stone was John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It is very beautiful, but we expected controversy along the lines of what? No crib! Or church abandons crib, Christmas crib for new millennium. We were sufficiently anxious to assemble all the people who worked in the media who were part of the congregation and called them the St Martin's Sultans of Spin. We needn't have worried. A very sympathetic piece by Andrew Brown in The Guardian set the tone for everything else, which universally was warm, friendly and very positive. By contrast, after the crowds celebrating England winning the World Cup, uh, the Rugby World Cup in 2003, gosh, that seems a long time ago, a distant memory. England winning the Rugby World Cup, 2003. Um, the crowd that came into Trafalgar Square to celebrate that trashed the Christmas crib by Josephina de Vasconcellos, which had been used for about 40 years. So the first project for the Arts Advisory Panel was a competition for a new crib. We invited five mostly well-known artists to make proposals. We made a point of ensuring that on any group that we were commissioning, uh, we had at least one unknown younger artist. Uh, their proposals were very exciting and they got quite a bit of publicity. For example, the art critic Richard Cork, who was a member of the panel, 
wrote a piece in the New Statesman, A Crib for a Bed, which was subtitled, Trafalgar Square will be the scene of a heretical new nativity. That sounds a fractious embrace, but in fact it was a very enthusiastic and friendly piece that recognised the difficulty of a commission which has to address the mystery of the virgin birth. The one that won was com and was commissioned was by Tomoaki Suzuki, a young Japanese woodcarver based in Hackney in East London. It was conventional and exceptionally beautiful, but it got a surprisingly critical reception, not least because Anne Widdicombe commented very stridently and negatively about it being politically correct because the figures reflected the ethnic diversity of London and were based on people in the local community or known to the artist. I don't think she'd even been to see it. There was a much more interesting critique in the Telegraph about the difficulty of representing the Christmas story in a literal way. They thought that a non-Christian artist was too conventional and not challenging enough and raised interesting points about how an outsider to the Christian faith and culture could engage in, with this story in a way that has intellectual standing and depth. Other responses were much more positive, especially about the link that Tomo had made with a well-known painting by Piero della Francesca in the National Gallery on the north side of the square. For me, to see children wondering at the sight of the crib was enough. And there's no doubt that that crib is a winner. It's a good experience of the way, it was a good experience of the way in which good art creates controversy and controversy can be a good way of generating a very profitable public discussion about art and Christianity, a sort of Christian apologetic in which the church has to engage without having full control. During the renewal of St Martin's, I discovered what ought to be blindingly obvious in this relationship between Christianity and art, and that's the significance of the patron, the donor, the creation of the brief, and the choice of artist. Each are keys to the success of artistic commissions. Originally in St Martin's there had been clear glass, then Victorian stained glass, which had been blown out by a bomb falling nearby in the Second World War. We learned that the present east window was recycled Whitefriars glass. It spoke of the resurrection after London had survived the war. People liked the simplicity of the Blue Cross, and St Martin's was a church which knew about hope in the midst of human dereliction. The cross was absolutely central to the theology of that church. It was a window in front of which people had poured themselves out in prayer. It was therefore invested with huge significance. Fortunately, there was still a living memory of the installation of the window. One of those who had been in the congregation at the time said they'd always wondered why the cross was a bit short and dumpy and said that it was like the woman who designed it. She said no one at the time thought it would have lasted as long as it had, but it was the best that London could do at the end of the war. It was quite helpful that when we came back into a renewed but not yet complete St Martin's, the old window was still in place and looking very out of place. It convinced even those who had opposed its removal that it was no longer right. And and it was a transformed church, a building that I always thought was rather square and, and uh, rectangular and suddenly emerged as a Baroque church with lots of circles and soaring uh, columns and heights. The brief for the artist for the window emphasised that it would be work of the highest artistic quality. We wanted it to work harmoniously with the architecture and visual richness of the church. Given the diversity of London, we hoped it would provide uh, would, would be meaningful for people from diverse cultural and ethnic backgrounds. It needed to play its part in the life of the church, both as a focal point at the east end of the church and inspire reflection and contemplation, but also in the way it attracted a sense of inquiry and engaged the attention of all 
who visit the church. The donor was anonymous, even to me. I was told by a go-between that they were a member of the congregation who had inherited some money unexpectedly. And they thought that if others knew that they had that sort of money, it would change their relationship with everybody in the congregation. So they didn't want anybody to know. Um, actually, I started by thinking this is a thorough nuisance. Um, the really good thing about anonymous donors is I found myself looking at the whole congregation and wondering, well, it could be you. So I had to be nice to everyone. <laughs> I thought this was rather a good thing, actually. The only condition uh, that the anonymous donor put down was that the artist was made aware of that text about Jacob's Ladder, which was there in the consecration and dedication of the church in Zachariah Pierce's sermon. And that poem by Francis Thompson, which is known as either In No Strange Land, or sometimes it's known as The Kingdom of God, um, which is quite well known, but is very well known in the St. Martin's community, because it's almost certainly inspired by an incident connected with St. Martin's and had become part of the church's self-understanding of being a place like Jacob's Ladder, pitched halfway twixt heaven and Charing Cross. We said in the brief that artists may also wish to reference some of the themes uh, and starting points of the art strategy as a whole, which you can sort of see in the way the building's been renewed. Light, reflection, contemplation, stillness, Eternity, eternal values, faith, belief, prayer, the Christian story, narratives, values, miracles and metaphor, care, homelessness, homecoming, oasis, refuge, sanctuary, compassion, friendship, community, reaching out and welcoming in. Music, ritual, ceremony, St. Martin of Tours, the Royal Parish Church, the Church of the Ever Open Door. Within the context of that rather long list, the shortlisted art artists were asked to consider the following factors. The location and setting within the church and its surroundings, visibility to the church's congregation, visitors and concert audiences, daytime and nighttime usage, lighting within the church, the architect's design and colour schemes, the church's orientation and the direction of sunlight. Five artists were invited to submit designs. The exhibition of their proposals produced a lot of interest and some strongly stated expressions of concern. Well, it's, I mean, it's quite something to muck about with a building this prominent. By a majority, the Arts Advisory Panel advised the, the PCC that the proposal by Shirazé Hushiari should be, uh, she should be invited to develop her design. Uh, Shirazé is an Iranian woman uh, who had lived in London for over 20 years. She'd been brought up a Muslim uh, in the Sufi tradition. She had never worked in glass before. It was quite high risk. The PCC were much less sure and were evenly divided. Um, this proposal evoked very strong responses from everyone. One of the church wardens was articulate in saying that he wasn't convinced it reflected the church's mission statement, that St Martin in the Fields exists to honour God by being an open and inclusive church that enables people to question and discover for themselves the significance of Jesus Christ. People saw this proposal rather like one of those pictures um, where you can see it both ways. Uh, and some people saw it as that very expansive moment of creation, the Big Bang. Everything flew outwards and everything was possible. And others saw it like I suppose more like a black hole sucking you in and constraining you and you feeling more and more cramped. And that's why it didn't seem to fit the church's mission statement of being an open, inclusive church in which people can question and discover for themselves the significance 
of Jesus Christ. In July 2006, I wrote a factual statement for the church community. The Arts Advisory Panel recommended by a majority that Shirase Hushiari and Pip Horn, that's her partner and architect, should be invited to develop their design to the next stage with a view to it being commissioned. This recommendation was subject to A, satisfactory glass test panels being produced, and B, agreement on the budget. The parochial church council, also by majority, actually the truth is, it was the, the, the PCC voted absolutely evenly either way, and I as the chair got the casting vote, and I had to vote, I, I, I didn't want to go ahead with a project where there was such contention just wasn't right to go ahead so even though I loved the window I voted against it in, in, in order to give ourselves time and the PCC decided by majority also to reject the panel's advice this was partly on the grounds of cost the proposal being twice as expensive as had been anticipated the PCC also expressed concerns about the particular design which provoked very strong feelings both for and against the Arts Advisory Panel's recommendation was made at the conclusion of an exhaustive and thoughtful process in which the work of 66 artists was considered, 53 of whom had worked in or had trained in glass. We were being criticised for not having uh, considered stained glass artists. It's a measure of the significance and sensitivity of the task that both the recommendation and the decision were by majority but it's disappointing to everyone involved that this process has not produced an acceptable result. The Parochial Church Council has asked the Arts Advisory Panel to advise it on its way forward. It took a few months and some very skillful chairmanship to work this through. Shirazay was invited to respond to the PCC's comments. She tentatively reworked her proposals and straightened the lines to what looked to me like a cross. Oh, she said, somewhat surprised, it's abstract. It got almost unanimous agreement from the PCC, one person abstained. The care with which Shirase worked on the proposal was astonishing. She spent hours in the building at different times of day and night and came to services and concerts to get the feel of the building and the way it's used. The window was revealed live, well, sort of live, on Radio 4's front row. And thank goodness I didn't have to pre pretend that it more than met my hopes. The window has received very positive affirma affirmation from the arts and architectural community, and mostly very strong affirmation from the church community. It's taken time. My predecessor was typical. He came to see the window a week before the Thanksgiving service for the renewal. In all honesty, he told me afterwards, I thought you'd made a terrible mistake. But when I came back for the service and saw it for the second time, I thought it was absolutely marvellous. I was grateful that James Woodward commented on this, uh, that it's, uh, this is a reminder that art forces us to take the longer view. We need to be honest about our responses, but also to take a perspective which acknowledges the complexity with which we engage in any dimension of our living and seeing. Art can contain and hold, whoops, I'm going the wrong way now. Art can contain and hold paradox, contradiction, and ambiguity. It uses a different language. This is back to me now, not, not James. It, this window uses a different language to most church art. Actually, I think it uses a different language to any church art. It isn't stained glass. Though an astonishing number of people talk about it as the stained glass window. And it has three quite distinct moods. In the early morning, with the sun shining from the east, it's a clear window. You can see straight through it. And as the day goes on, the etched glass becomes more apparent. And then at night, uh, the ellipse is lit and is very prominent. Ask people what they see and the responses are varied. To me, it's a cross. One of my ordained colleagues claimed she couldn't see across, as the artist said she didn't either. It seems to draw you to a reality beyond. Or is it the creative tension of energy and force lines? The ellipse is the head of Christ on the cross. The stone rolled from the tomb. 
the Eucharistic host being presented to the people. But it's none of these things, it's abstract. For a while, I thought its significance might lie in its being a focus of prayer in a London church by an Iranian woman whose own religious formation had been in Islam. Nine years on, and I'm more confident that it is, I think it's a great work of art, but like any art in sacred space, it's not only a work of art, perhaps not primarily a work of art. The whole process has made me think much harder about the implications of putting work of art, works of art from a religious context in the secular space of a museum or gallery. One thing leads to another. The renewal of St. Martin's had decluttered the church and the sanctuary. You sort of get the sense of that with the new altar that you can see and the cross behind. New benches were commissioned from the architect. The altar is by Shirazeh Hushiari as well. We tried really hard that she wasn't going to do the altar as well as the window, but she understood the building so well. And then a new processional cross and candlesticks by Brian Gatling. Really striking. Through some American members of the congregation, St. Martin's made a link with the Roman Catholic Benedictine community in Collegeville in Minnesota. In about 1998, St. John's had commissioned Donald Jackson, the Queen's calligrapher, to produce a handwritten illuminated Bible to ignite the spiritual imagination with the word of God for the new millennium. It was completed in 2011. I was in Donald's studio in Monmouthshire when he was putting the last touches to the final page of the book of Revelation. I think it was in July 2011. Now those clever monks realised that they only had one copy of this. It was a handwritten illuminated manuscript. But they could produce cards, prints and a very high quality facsimile edition uh, uh, of seven volumes. And St. Martin's was presented with one of the copies. It's worth quite a lot of money. The only condition being that it was used in services. It's a wonderful gift. Uh, and I think it's so far the only copy in the United Kingdom. Uh, being the sort of community St. Martin's is, people started to play with it. And there was an extraordinary concert in which one of the choir who worked in theatre lighting produced an animated uh, lighting display from the pictures in the Bible uh, to accompany music and readings. It was fantastically well done, quite astonishing the way things moved off the page and over the windows. The arts community gained confidence in St Martin's and willingly engaged. Sometimes it was important to hold our nerve and remember that we wanted works of the highest quality. Temporary exhibitions provided plenty of scope for experiment and adventure. For things that would be permanent, we learned that it was better to wait than to accept the second rate. An extraordinary contact produced a tapestry by Gerhard Richter, which makes the Dick Shepherd Chapel in the lower crypt a place for meditation and prayer. I don't think the picture does it justice but it's almost like Monet's lilies, and it's really clever reflection, uh, mirrored images, creating a very meditative still panel. And I imagine that Richter was cautious about work for churches following the Archbishop of Cologne's opposition to his window in Cologne Cathedral. The Archbishop did not like it. Well, so much he didn't want it. Um, good art creates controversy. But the artist won't always want to find himself head to head with a senior figure. Uh, I'm delighted that Richter's now so pleased with the tapestry at St Martin's that he's working on others that might be suitable for the site. I think there are some really exciting developments just around the corner. Mm. <laughs> That we now take it for granted that newly commissioned art has its place in most churches and cathedrals has a great deal to do with the insight, persistence and energy of the late Tom Devonshire Jones, who founded Art and Christianity Inquiry. And there's the postcard about them on your seat. There is a burgeoning of art in places of worship. 30 years ago, I don't think that was anything like true. 
Um, I saw some of this recently when I was chairing the Art and Christianity Inquiry Awards for Art in a Religious Context last year. The 40 entries represented only a sample of what's going on, but they were heartening. Some great artists are working in churches. For example, Christopher Le Brun's beautiful and practical window wilderness in the London School of Economics multi-faith space. Um, it, it's actually a window which uh, hides a horrible view. There are buildings quite close to the sort of looking out of the window uh, and it's a, it's a very practical architectural device but it makes the space uh, and it, it creates something which gets around the problem of Islam not wanting uh, depiction of, uh, of art and images uh, but it does actually create a sense of wilderness within, within what's a really beautiful prayer room. Or Mark Casale's window of St. Said in Chelmsford Cathedral. I don't think it's Casale's best work. I think he's done some brilliant work in churches, but I don't think this was quite up to it, really. Or Maggie Hamblings, uh, uh, the resurrection spirit uh, in the church in Mayfield in Sussex. Uh, I'm sorry I haven't got a photograph. The ones I've got on my phone simply aren't good enough. But the church in Mayfield has been so well looked after over a long time. And to get an artist of Maggie Hambling's quality, engaging with it and producing something so simple, interesting uh, and uh, effective uh, was really, really striking. Uh, when we were trying to establish a shortlist, I was reminded of a question asked at St Martin's by Vivian Lovell from the arts consultant's modus operandi. Does it have slow burn intensity? That's brilliant. Does it have slow burn intensity? With so much that's polite and well-mannered in church art, it's a good question, which is sometimes answered by the context as well as the art. Um, among those on the shortlist, we put these enhancements to St Mary's Ifley on the edge of Oxford by Nicholas Minear and Roger Wagner. Um, they did have the advantage of working in a marvellous church. Um, they were enhancing work where their predecessors had loved and cared for the place and done it beautifully. Roger Wagner's windows are made in Tom Denny's studio near Blandford Forum. Um, I'm a great fan of Tom, Tom's work. Tom is quoted near the end of Richard Harris' book on the image of Christ in modern art. This is so interesting and so, so distinctive of this school of church artists. Tom said, a lot of the things that we're interested in are not generally esteemed in the contemporary art world. What we're interested in is not being irreverent, but reverent. Not referencing things, but being things. These church artists are distinctive and their work greatly enhances a building that's been there for a thousand years. John Madison's Reredos and Altar at Ely Cathedral, they are superb. Um, there's an absolutely ghastly sculpture just above them, which I think is a huge mistake, which I wish I could persuade the present Dean of Ely to get rid of. Um, uh, and the scale and focus of this altar and the reredos takes your eye down and refocuses the space. John Madison understands the space so perfectly and I think it must reflect a very careful collaboration between the artist and the cathedral's architect, who is his wife. Bill Viola's Martyrs at St Paul's Cathedral was ambitious in both subject and the setting of the installation. It takes your eye down the south aisle from under the edge of the dome on the south side. Without the liturgical context, I thought it was much harder to read what was going on with fire, water, earth and air. But I was very struck that visitors were attentive and stayed through the whole sequence uh, of this video, uh, which lasted, I would think, four or five minutes. It's intensely theological, addressing the big issues of the day. And it asks questions about meaning, life, death and what we'd give our lives for. Mark Urbanik's HS took me a while to think. I suppose HS stands for Holy Spirit. Actually, the artist wasn't going to own that. It's HS. 
at St. Michael's Camden Town. Um, Urbanik's a local artist. Actually, I discovered that I think, he was, I think he's Polish and he lived round the corner of the church and the then vicar met him and they were talking about this and this is what came out of it. Uh, it's not immediately obvious that this uh, installation is made from photocopied black bin liners. It's dramatic and theological and practical and that it covers a large and badly damaged wall relatively cheaply. It's intended to be a temporary installation and the wall does need to be repaired. HS makes a huge impact on the church building and the local community. It works on every level. Art transforms a place of worship and renews both place and people who are the church. It communicates deep and wide in, in just as the gift of the Holy Spirit in baptism does. It conveys what cannot be spoken. Um, to the judges of the ACE uh, Art in a Religious Context panel, it was a clear winner. But in this aspect of life, all are winners, all shall have prizes. And because the local communities and the churches engage with this, and in each place it seems to work. So I want to finish by making one further and rather obvious point about the way in which the local church can extend its reach and impact by engaging local artists. There was a marvellous example of this in Bridport uh, during the latter part of Holy Week, Passion Tide, when local artists were invited to paint the Stations of the Cross in the same sort of way as has been happening in Stanley Spencer's Cookham for the last nine years. It was Philip Ringer, who had the, it was the genius who made the connection to make this happen. It's really lovely that you've come up tonight, Philip. Um, I'm only going to show a couple of the stations because otherwise it's going to go on far too long. Um, uh, the artists were given a brief that included the standard size of each painting, that people should be in contemporary dress and in places that might be recognisable to those who live in Bridport. The stations were placed on a route that stretched about 2.5 miles from St Swithin's Allington through Bridport down to West Bay. Uh, truthfully, the paintings were varied in both design and quality. They caught the attention of the town, got on the regional TV news, but in this case it was the impact they had on the artists that I found so striking, because it was their engagement with the events that they were depicting. The paintings had a power, powerful effect on them. Just two examples. Mary Coles said, here we are before Christ being stripped takes a moment to, to get your eye. Mary Coles, the artist, said, painting this picture of Jesus being stripped before the crucifixion has made me focus on Jesus himself. What was going on in his mind, his attitude to those around him? And it certainly made me search the scriptures with attention that I've never given to those verses before. I've painted the scene outside the Lyric Theatre, at one time a strip joint. When in warmer weather, Barry and I sit outside there with our box office coffees, I imagine Jesus there in the street and wonder what our attitude would be to him today if he physically walked our street to Bridport. Elaine Butcher, who painted this station of, it's the deposition of Christ, isn't it? Christ taken down from the cross and being placed in the tomb. Uh, she is a Christian. She said, I wanted to portray the reality of the cruelty and agony that Jesus suffered at the hands of the very people that he loved. I wanted to show that despairing Mary and Joseph of Arimathea at this time, as they were unaware that Jesus would be raised from the dead three days later. Well, that's a question, isn't it? The modern dress and the local scene means to me that it's as important today in West Bay as it was 2,000 years ago, just what Jesus did for all of us. I couldn't look at that without thinking of a priest who died in an accident, uh, drowned just along the coast from there a couple of years ago, uh, rowing his way back um, from Cornwall where he'd been on retreat. 
The art is real, relational, and leads to resurrection. It renews hope. As Thomas Merton said, art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. That's gospel. Engaging arts and minds is a sort of Christian apologetic which grows people and communities and enlarges the reach and impact of the Christian faith beyond words. Next week I will take one of the big issues of our day, the environmental challenge and the care of our common home. James Woodward found a wonderful link in Rome for Holy Week and Easter when he saw an exhibition in response to the papal encyclical Laudato Si, to the roots of life by Settimo Tamanini in the church of St Ignazio Loyola. The exhibition brochure says that Pope Francis has invited us to safeguard creation, to be custodians of beauty and guard against greed. In this combination of ethics and aesthetics, the trees of glowing copper have been transfigured and transformed through fire. They provide a perspective of matter unified and transfigured. The brochure says the church as a building symbolises the person of Christ. All in that building symbolically reveals his person. The quote from Colossians, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. There's a quotation on the front page of the exhibition brochure, which I think must be from the sayings of the Desert Fathers. On a winter day, a Desert Father asked an old monk, sorry, on a winter day, a Desert Father asked an old, black and withered tree, talk to me about God. And the tree blossomed.